Hi, this is Bhaskar Napte and I am the founder of Pharma Growth Hub. I have helped more than 700 pharma professionals to get absolute clarity on to the various technical aspect like method validation, stability study, method development, various quality management tools. So in case if you are struggling uh, with the understanding of such kind of, uh, you know, the technical aspect or in case if you are not able to find the right opportunity for yourself, Pharma Growth Hub can certainly help you. To know more about services of the Pharma Growth Hub, you can send me a message on to the WhatsApp number or uh, that you can see on the screen right now. You can type interested and send me across. So as a part of today's video, we are going to understand what is the meaning of analytical validation and what are the various parameters that one has to consider while performing it. So let us understand what is mean of analytical method validation. So it is the practical activity that you need to conduct to confirm that the analytical method that you are using or you have developed in house and that you intend to use that particular method is really suitable for that purpose. For example, if you have developed a analytical test procedure for assay of paracetamol tablet. So is this analytical test procedure really suitable for its intended purpose? I mean for quantifying the paracetamol out of the paracetamol tablet. So how you can identify how you can get the answer for this question as yes or no by conducting the analytical method validation. Now when I say it, by conducting the analytical method validation, now what I supposed to do? And there are some set of parameters which are actually given into the ICH guideline Q2R1. And let us discuss about all those parameters one by one. So the very first parameters that is the specificity or selectivity. Now this is the parameter which is going to confirm or which is going to study that your analyte can be quantified without interference. In case let us say as we have taken the example of paracetamol tablets assay, what is your analyte over here? What is your interested analyte? It is nothing but a paracetamol. So out of this paracetamol tablet, there are different uh, excipients present. There could be some of the paracetamol degradants present into a sample. And you cannot avoid this sample matrix. Or there can be chances of having some interference coming out of the diluent. The solvent system that you are using to make a paracetamol tablet sample. So understand, you know, from all these different matrices, if there is no interference at the retention time of paracetamol, I mean, I'm assuming the HPLC test procedure, right? If there is no interference from your solvent system, from your degradants, from your excipients, placebo, we say, then you can say, look here, I have a specific test procedure for paracetamol assay for the paracetamol tablet. So I hope you are clear on to the, the specificity part and how one can prove that. You can prove by ideally, I mean, you can prove by, you know, looking at the retention time of the degradants. You can prove by running the placebo sample and then understanding, look here, there is nothing eluting at the retention time of paracetamol and hence my method is precise. The second parameter that you need to consider as a validation is the precision. So the analytical precision or the precision of analytical test procedure is measured as the, the degree of scatter between the measured uh, values. Degree of scatter means how these results are, you know, away from each other or are they closely associated with each other. 
So if the results are closely associated with each other, then you will say, okay, my test results are very, very precise. Hmm? They are very close to each other. But in case if you make the six different measurement and if you found that the results are highly scattered, they are away from each other, then what you are going to say, now I have the imprecise test procedure. I hope you understand the, the meaning of precision. The close the results with each other, precise they are, right? Far are they from each other, imprecise they are, right? So the precision is measured again at three different levels. The one is called as the repeatability. The second one is called as the intermediate precision. And the third one is called as the reproducibility. So let us understand these all three terms one by one. The first one is what? Repeatability, right? So what is meaning of repeatability? So in case if you are, you know, uh, preparing the sample in a short period of time, like within a day, and you are analyzing those all samples by using same analytical instrument, equipment, solvent that you are using for preparation of the solutions, then you can say that I have actually conducted the repeatability. The second uh, level of uh, precision is called as the intermediate precision. So for example, today you perform the paracetamol tablet assay by uh, measuring the precision for six samples, right? And then tomorrow, what I'm going to do, I am also going to perform the similar experiment. But now, I am not going to use the SPLC that you have used. I am going to use the different SPLC system. I am going to use different pH meter in case if the pH meter is the part of our analytical measurement. I am going to use the different set of instrument and the equipment. I am also going to use the different uh, solvents. Maybe grade cannot be different by the way, but the, the manufacturer can be different. So if I use the JT Baker solvent, I will use the Rankem solvent, maybe estronitrile, right? So and so forth. So essentially we're talking about the different analyst on different day by using different instrument, equipment and the solvents, etc. I am actually performing the intermediate precision, but I am doing it everything in the same lab. You and I work in the same lab, right? So it is nothing but the, the, the repeatability, but performed by the another analyst by on another day by using another set of instrument equipment chemicals, but within the same lab then that particular experiment is called as the intermediate precision. I hope you are clear uh, as far as repeatability and intermediate precision is concerned. So what is the third level of precision? It is the reproducibility. Now what is the meaning of reproducibility? So we talked about repeatability, we talked about intermediate precision. Let us say there is a another lab of our organization right and uh, we work at hyderabad lab and the another lab is situated into a bangalore and there is an analyst which is uh, let us say uh, sopan so sopan works at bangalore and if sopan performs the same experiment what is the experiment by the way the measurement of paracetamol assay inside the paracetamol tablet. So if the SOPAN execute the same experiment the way I and you executed by you know preparing the same number of samples like six, I hope we prepared six samples. Then what SOPAN is actually doing? SOPAN is actually doing the reproducibility you done the repeatability, I performed intermediate precision and the SOPAN is now performing a reproducibility. So I hope you understand all three levels of precision. I hope so. Now this is the second parameter that we just discussed. Note, and as a part of this uh, 
measurement we are going to understand the, the degree of scatter that is also called as the percent RST. So how much these results are away from each other that is the percent RST or the standard deviation or the just a relative standard deviation that is the way to assess precision. The third important parameter that is called as the accuracy. Now accuracy has the multiple names like recovery, some people say bias, some people say the, uh, the, the trueness etc. But let us stick to the uh, term accuracy while explaining this particular term. So what is mean by accuracy? The accuracy is nothing but you know the difference between the observed value and the declared true value or the difference between the observed value and the true value. So if the observed value is very very close to true value then I can say okay now my method is highly accurate but in case if the observed value is away from the true value then I will say okay now, now my method is not that accurate. So how to understand this uh, true value and I will explain again with the help of paracetamol assay. So you are going to measure the paracetamol assay out of what? Out of your sample matrix like excipient, degradant, sample diluent and etc. So the extraction process is very very essential. You know? the, the extraction means what? How the paracetamol present into a solid form is going to get into a solution form and the moment it goes into a solution form we will say now the paracetamol has got extracted from the sample matrix. But let us say if I add now, I take the placebo, I take the sample diluent, I create the sample matrix, I create the sample matrix and then I will spike uh, the 100 milligram of the paracetamol. How much I spiked? I spiked 100 milligram of the paracetamol inside this uh, uh, sample matrix. Now this 100 milligram is nothing but the true value because I am going to measure the exact weight right that is 100 milligram. So 100 milligram becomes the true value and then I will conduct the experiment as like my standard test procedure maybe sonication, filtration or centrifugation for the dilution etc. And then I will calculate now at the end of this experiment how much is the paracetamol got measured and I will say okay now I found 99 milligram as the paracetamol content. Now this 99 milligram is my observed value. Now what is the difference between my observed value and the true value? <laughs> it is just a 1%. So if the 1% is the difference can you say that my method is accurate? The results are very closely associated. I mean my measured value is very very close to this true value and then I can say look here I have the accurate method. But in case if uh, I get only 90 milligram of the paracetamol out of conducting all these measurements then can you say that my method is really accurate? Now there is almost 10 milligram gap between the observed value and the true value. So this is the third parameter that is the accuracy of your test procedure. Now the fourth important parameter is called as the detector linearity. Detector linearity. Now in, in case of detector linearity you are actually trying to understand whether my Beer's law is getting obeyed or not in case of PD, in case of UV detector. Okay, I am assuming that HPLC UV detection system. So any detector, by the way, I am just giving an example of uh, UV detector. You can have the RI, ALS, or any another detector, but the principle is going to remain one and the same. Whether I am getting the proportionate decrease or increase in the response with the proportionate decrease or increase in this concentration. 
or in another way whether my response is proportional to the concentration of the analyte let me explain you in a very simple way let us say we prepare the paracetamol sample of 100 ppm concentration now what is the concentration strength it is the 100 ppm and if i measure the response i get uh, let us say 100 area to make it very very simple and clear to you how much area i got for 100 ppm paracetamol sample i got 100 area if i make the paracetamol sample with the concentration of 50 ppm how much i should expect the response now i must expect the 50 area right so in the proportionate to the concentration if i get exactly 50 area then i will say okay now from 100 ppm to 50 ppm i am able to achieve the linear response and hence my method is linear from 100 ppm to 50 ppm then i will say let me also check the linearity or the response at 200 ppm now what is the expected response at 200 ppm paracetamol concentration it is nothing but the 200 area and if i get the 200 area actually then i will say look at here now my method is linear from 50 ppm to 200 ppm so that is very important to confirm that you know your detector is not the limitations in terms of understanding the response to the concentration because though you are very much sure that your drug product is going to have the paracetamol in certain range but you should always ready for the worst case scenario in case if during the manufacturing the batch has got only 50 percent of the api will your method able to detect the concentration at 50 percent and in case if the during manufacturing the paracetamol has got added at its 200 percent will your method able to detect the 200 percent response or not that is the linearity i hope you understand the the meaning of linearity now the the fourth important parameter is the robustness of your test procedure robustness means what see we all work and we know that there are certain variations always possible maybe during ph measurement maybe during adding and measuring the exact organic solvent maybe during weighing the salt maybe during sonication time and we cannot really control on those variables are you going to control that certainly not so having understood that there are likely variations possible during all the stages of my analytical experiment then how these variations going to impact on to my test result my performance of the analytical test procedures so what i am going to do i am going to understand what are the critical variables what are the critical attributes that are certainly going to impact on to my analytical test procedures or what are the method pro para what are the method steps what are the method steps that are going to impact on to my critical analytical attributes what are the critical analytical attributes can be a resolution can be a uh, percent rsd for your standard solutions can be a theoretical theoretical plates uh, what else mm -hmm. can be a tailing factor so these are the critical analytical attributes for your analytical method and what are the critical method steps you can say the adjustment of the ph or the sonication of the taste sample or it can be about uh, you know setting the uh, splg system to its uh, or the, the content of organic solvent inside the mobile phase or the temperature of the column now these are according to your risk assessment are the critical parameters critical method steps so you are going to challenge those critical method steps deliberately so you will change the the ph of the mobile phase in the range of let us say plus or minus 0.5 for example if your ph of the mobile phase is 5 then you are going to make a mobile phase with the ph of 4.5 and then run the chromatographic system and understand how this critical analytical attributes like uh speak tailing like theoretical plates retention time are impacting 
and if there is no impact then you will say look at here now my method is also robust now at ph 4.5 now this is robustness studying at the minus variation you will also conduct the robustness with the plus variation and then you will define look here now my method is robust between this window this range of the ph 4.5 to 5.5 but for some reason, if your method is not found to be robust between this 4.5 to 5.5, you can certainly narrow down the range. Okay, 4.5, my telling is not good. Let me study that uh, again with the pH 4.2, right? And okay, now the pH, pH 4.2, the pig has lesser telling within the acceptable uh, limit. And then I will say, it is not uh, robust from pH 4.5, but now it is found to be robust from pH 4.2 onwards, maybe the 5.5 pH still, 5.5 pH. So this is the way the robustness can be studied. So we talked about the method variations as a robustness study, but that is not the end of the story, right? You also need to perform solution stability to understand how long your analytical solution can be used whether within a one day or two day and you can also perform the solution stability on the bench top means at your lab temperature or in case if you want to perform the solution stability at the reduced temperature like in the refrigerator at 5 degrees celsius it is also possible you can conduct the solution stability for both standard and sample because the solution stability is very important in case if you are investigating some failures like out of the spec result like some deviations so during those time if you prove that my solutions are stable for longer time then you can use those solution for investigation for the long duration the another important point is in case if you are using the uh, filter paper you need to understand the whether my filter paper is really suitable for the uh, filtration or not and very important parameter is the filter saturation volume Please don't ignore this parameter. Now, what is meant by filter uh, saturation volume? We all know that the filter paper is also going to absorb your analyte. So, if you filter the 1 ml of the sample solution and then, you know, uh, collect the uh, uh, sample solution and then measure the response. This is the saturation with the 1 ml then you are going to saturate the filter paper with the 2 ml of the filtrate. So you will allow pass this 2 ml of the sample solution and then co collect the filtrate and then measure the response. So this is the response you got after saturating the filter paper with 2 ml of the sample solution. Then saturate the filter paper for 3, the 4 and 5 until you find that there is a, uh, there is a, you know, the consistent result after that so for example if you found that uh, at 1 ml filter saturation i got 95 percent as a result with 2 ml of the filter saturation i got 98 percent result with the 3 ml of the filter saturation i got 99 percent result with the 4 ml again i got 99 percent result with the 5 ml of the saturation i got 99 percent result so at what volume of the filters uh, at, at, at what volume your filter got saturated okay so understand that 3 ml onwards there is no change in the assay result you got 99 percent at 3 ml 99 percentage at 4 ml and 99 percent at 5 ml so you can say minimum 3 ml sample solution needs to be allowed to pass and then you can collect the uh, solution and then analyze it. So this is the filter saturation study. It is also important to study the forced degradation as a part of your specificity. Now why the forced degradation is required? Now look here, you are trying to understand the interference, interference out of the sample matrix. It can be degradants, it can be process impurities, it can be your excipient, it can be solvent system that you are using to make the solution. Now, here is a caution. How do you know that the sample that you are using today to perform the specificity has got all the possible degradants? 
Can you guarantee that? And you will say, no, I, how can I guarantee that? So you never know that, you know, all the possible degrader that is going to generate over a period of the entire shelf life for the given product. Maybe the paracetamol tablet has a shelf life of five years. So you are analyzing the sample of just a one month old sample, which is just manufactured and out of the factory. So the sample has to go long, almost another uh, four years and 11 months. So within this four years and 11 months, the sample is going to experience different uh, the conditions, environmental conditions like different light, different humidity, different temperature. And in case if there is a different, uh, you know, the, the pHs that the composition has, your drug product composition can be acidic, can be alkaline. There could be a possibility of oxidation because of presence of air or presence of peroxides, the impurities or the metal impurities present inside the drug product. Oh my God, there are numerous possibilities because of which the degradation is still can be uh, found. And you are not actually representing that sample complex matrix. So how to you know, create uh, the, the sample which will look like at the end of the shelf life. Okay, so I'm not. I'm sure you're not going to wait till the five years and then get the sample and perform the uh, the specificity. That much time will not be available with us. So you can, you know, you know, uh, you can create the the possible scenario uh, by conducting the forced degradation. So you can conduct the thermal degradation, shoot the sample at higher temperature and then understand what kind of thermal degradants possible. And if they are getting generated, are they well separated from the paracetamol? If the answer is yes, okay, so if in future, as my sample is going to experience the high and low temperature, I'm not going to worry much about that. Look at here, my method can able to separate all those thermal degradants. And then same is the case applicable for water hydrolysis in case of humidity uh, exposure. Same can be applicable for the, the light, the photo light degradation. So there are different conditions that you can certainly use to understand the, the entire forced degradation study. But just let me assure you, there are different parameters like acid hydrolysis, alkali hydrolysis, then uh, the, the photolytic degradation, the oxidative degradation, the thermal degradation, you can conduct the humidity degradation and what else you forgot. Okay, in case of, uh, in case if you are conducting the validation for Brazil market, now there is a guideline published by NVISA. So NVISA says that you also need to conduct the metal ion degradation. So metal ion degradation can be iron 3 or copper 2 plus. You can use the suitable reagent and understand how your degradants will separate it from each other. The another important part as a force degradation is to measurement of the spectral peak purity. Make sure that as you are not able to go to see whether there is any degradants co eluting with your main peak. How you are going to confirm that there is an absence of co elution and that is called as the peak purity measurements. So you will say, look at here, my peak is pure. And if the peak is pure, that indicates that there is nothing hidden inside your peak. The paracetamol peak only contain paracetamol and no another component. That is the peak purity concept. So as a part of force degradation, you also need to measure the peak purity. So I think we covered almost all parts of the validation, but still we left with one parameter. And what is that? <laughs> that is the LOD and LOQ, limit of detection and limit of quantitation. Now, this particular parameter is only required for the methods which are for quantification of impurities, like related substances, organic impurities or organic solvent. So for those test procedures, you need to also evaluate the limit of detection and the limit of quantitation. So what is mean by limit of detection? Limit of detection means uh, it is the concentration of your interested analyte which can just be detected but you cannot quantify it. 
you can say just okay look at here 2 ppm response i can able to see the peak coming out of that but i'm not sure whether i can quantify it accurately and precisely that is your limit of detection and the limit of detection can be measured it can be established or uh, you know identified by three different ways one is by visual inspection second one is by slope method and the third one is by signal to noise method you can google it and you will identify what are the different requirements for these three different procedures let us talk about the limit of quantitation the limit of quantitation is the that concentration of analyte which can be detected which can also be quantified with with acceptable precision and the accuracy so you must understand that to to claim that this is the loq of my test procedure you have to also prove that i can quantify that particular level i can quantify the impurity present at that particular level with acceptable precision and acceptable accuracy so that is what called as the limit of quantitation i think we have covered almost all validation parameters so i hope that you will understand what are the various parameters one has to consider during the analytical method validation thank you so much